So gee, we can't have gee. Sorry, but I would like. It's my that honor butt. privilege. Pardon me. Not but. <laughs> you can't have gee, so we got this guy. <laughs> Not long ago, I wrote an article called "He Fights." Um, I felt it was time that somebody explained the way that a lot of us feel, and apparently a lot of us do feel this way, because the article in Town Hall... Now, when somebody writes an article for Town Hall, if it's Dennis Prager, if it's um, uh, Jonah Goldberg, it averages about two, maybe three, maybe 5,000 shares. My article, He Fights, explaining why I support Donald Trump, has 66,000 shares. And, and the reason that I had 66,000 shares, and by the way, the reason that my talk is the single most viewed lecture in Heritage Foundation's history, a different talk, is, is because I answer questions that we all have. For example, why do our friends, good, smart, decent people, our, our colleagues, our neighbors, our relatives, why do they reject the facts, ignore the evidence, reject reason, and end up siding with evil, failure, and wrong at every turn. How is it you could possibly look at the Middle East and see this tiny, wonderful, liberal democracy of Israel with its things that liberals should love, freedom of speech, freedom of, gay pride parades, hmm. a woman prime minister all the way back in the 60s, surrounded by the most homophobic, xenophobic, misogynistic, and I do believe even a little bit anti-Semitic ideology of Islam. A little bit. And conclude that the problem is the Jews. There's got to be something wrong with these people. How do you look at Ferguson, Missouri and decide that this drug-addled thug who had just strong-armed a local businessman, an immigrant, by the way, a minority, who punched the cop in the face, tried to kill him with his own gun, he's the good guy. How do you conclude that the cop was an evil white racist, part of this conspiracy all over our country of evil white racist cops gunning down black children across America? How do you ignore the facts and come to the conclusion that it's always not just wrong? I'm sorry? As wrong as wrong, wrong can be wrong. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, the modern liberal is not only always wrong, he is always as wrong as wrong can be. Every one of his conclusions is not only diametrically opposed to the truth, but it invariably aids and benefits evil, failure, and wrong, and undermines the good, right, and successful. And so that's what my original book was about, which, by the way, I have copies of. <laughs> um, I'm absolutely willing to sign them to you. All right, two points I want to make that are relevant to what has already been discussed. One, the modern liberal, and really, I should call them leftists, because mm -hmm. as Dennis Prager always yes. makes, makes clear, there's a big difference between a liberal and a leftist. Yeah. In fact, there could not be a bigger difference. I am. You are liberals. You're lowercase l liberals. In fact, the reason we're conservatives is because what we seek to conserve is a liberal democracy. Yeah. We're the liberals. Yeah. All right, but I call them modern liberals for reasons I do explain in my book. And they are not hypocrites. This is not hypocrisy. You know, where was Betsy? Betsy, you may have heard of a person, a woman named Ayn Rand. And Ayn Rand said... There are no contradictions. If you think you found a contradiction, you must question your supposition. I, I borrowed that and adapted a little bit, and I say there are no hypocrites. I say if you think you found a hypocrite, you must question your predicate. All right? If you believe, for example, that Al Gore and the left care about the environment, <laughs> then he appears to be a hypocrite by flying around the globe in, in his jet planes and... and and speaking at conventions where he leaves the air conditioning on his motorcade running <laughs> so that when he returns, he can be comfortable. That seems hypocritical. But it's only hypocritical if you believe that the issue is the environment. Right. Once you recognize that there's no issue the leftist believe, that he says he believes and that he really believes in, not civil rights, not women's rights, not Palestinian rights, not any... Once you believe they don't care about the environment, then that doesn't make him a hypocrite. What they care about is finding a way of undermining Western civilization. Right. And the use of global warming or, or uh, what do they call it, climate change, the only purpose behind pretending to care is it's a way to shackle Western civilization and our prosperity. To close down our means of creating the wealth that we create and taxing us on what we've already created. 
So the left is not hypocritical when you see that they don't give a damn about black people. They don't give a damn about Thomas Sowell. They don't give a damn about Clarence Thomas. They don't give a damn about Condoleezza Rice. They don't give a damn about women. Once you recognize that nothing they say is what they mean, that all of these issues are fig leaves to give them respectability and cover for what is truly their goal, which is the undermining of Western civilization. So why would they want to undermine Western civilization? Well, for some, they're Marxists. But my cousin's not a Marxist. My cousin's an idiot. He didn't. He hasn't read. <laughs> Man, he hasn't read Das Kapital and Wade Capitalism versus and, and decide. No, he, he, he doesn't know. So why would he support the undermining of Western civilization? And the answer is this: the modern liberal—that's anybody who was born after World War II through today. Right? Fair enough. What, what are you laughing at? <laughs> you know my shtick. Well, but it's and it gets worse with each generation. But I would call this the modern liberal era, right? You have Generation X, and you have. That, that's getting, and by the way, there's a reason that it started at the end of World War II. And that is that the people, the great generations of Americans that came before us, culminating with what people have called the greatest generation, were so great and so successful, and our system was so wonderful that they bequeathed to us paradise. That's right. They bequeathed to us, think about this we are the first human beings in the history of the world. We are the only people, didn't matter what era, didn't matter what location, didn't matter your wealth, we are the only people in the history of the world to live in a world without communicable diseases. What disease? Smallpox? Vanquished. Chickenpox? Vanquished. Polio? Vanquished. Measles? Vanquished. We are the only people ever to live in such a world. We are the only people ever to live in a world without the possibility of hunger. You know, there's a hierarchy, there's a progression of need that goes something like this. Where can I find some food? Where can I find enough food? Where can I find good food? <laughs> where can I find gourmet food? I'll show you where we are in that progression. The question we now ask is, where can I find gourmet food for my cat? <laughs> and the answer, by the way, is at the 99 cent store because there's so much of it, they have to almost give it away. There's no such thing as hunger, and we are the first peoples ever in the history of the world to not know hunger. By the way, I want you to know how far down the list of diseases we are in America. All right? I said no smallpox, no chickenpox, no... We are so far down the list of diseases to worry about that we as a nation last year spent almost a billion dollars to put our best and our brightest minds together to try to eradicate restless leg syndrome. <laughs> right, we are so far down the list of physical things that we need to cure that we as a nation have spent close to a hundred billion dollars to finally make sure that a 75-year-old man can get an erection. <laughs> it's funny, because women don't usually applaud for that. <laughs> women usually go, I thought I was done with that. <laughs> and the reason, by the way, that 75-year-old men, men, because 75-year-old women look so good. <laughs> That's the era in which we live. Is that right, Michael? <laughs> I do, yeah. Did that go too far? <laughs> it's her mother who said it's, right? So all that being said, there is the people who were born after World War II have lived in a world that has been paradise. And when you live in paradise, when nothing can go wrong, then the right answer to everything is the utopian answer. If there's no such thing as diseases, why not let illegal aliens come in? If there's no such thing as poverty, why not let them come in? If there's no such thing as crime, why not let them come in? In fact, not only is the right answer in utopia always the utopian answer, anyone who disagrees is not just wrong, he's evil. If nothing bad can happen when illegal aliens come, then the only reason you can be against them is because you're a xenophobe and you're a racist. 
The problem is the world isn't really paradise. America is paradise. America is paradise because of our Judeo-Christian values, because of our Protestant work ethic, because of our Constitution. Those things like diseases, they're returning now. Those diseases that had been eradicated are returning, including the plague, has been found again in America. And bad things can happen. And the difference between us and them is we are the people who think that we know that there are bad things out there and we need to think and discriminate between what is good and what is bad, what is healthy and what is dangerous, what is helpful and what is hurtful, what is beautiful and what is ugly. That's when they define us as a hate group. That's what they mean is that we discriminate. Of course we discriminate. We're discriminating shoppers. We're discriminating citizens. We're discriminating people. That's what the left means when they say that we discriminate. Of course we do. In fact, the very essence of rational thought is discrimination. It's the entire purpose of thought is to discriminate. When the left says that we don't discriminate, they're absolutely right. They don't. Neither does a five-year-old child. They are incapable of doing so. Unfortunately, well, those who don't discriminate need a parent, need a grown-up. That's why you don't leave the five-year-old child alone in the kindergarten classroom. That's why there has to be a teacher there. That's why there has to be a parent there. For the left, that is the government. The government takes over the role of the parent and the teacher while they continue to live as if they are five-year-old children. Right. Problem is this. The parent has to earn a living. Mm -hmm. The parent has to be strong. The parent has to be... And we are now being swamped by generations that have never known a world where anything bad can happen. Yeah. They don't know a world that, that awaits them when they destroy this civilization. Right. They don't know a world. Right. And it's funny because Karen was talking about the headline said that we're against immigrants. Right. We adore immigrants because immigrants actually side with us. Yes. They side with us because they know the world that they escaped and how horrible it is. It's those who have never seen a world outside of this utopia, which is why on college campuses, which yeah. is pure utopia, yeah. right? You don't even do your own dishes. Yes. <laughs> you don't make your own dinner. You don't, do, you don't do your own dishes. You sit and you talk and you play Frisbee. And, and by those of you who think that college should be free, right? It's the stupidest thing in the world. I would rather pay for myself for four years than once I get a job, spend the rest of my life paying for everybody else to go to college. Because at least I'm in control of my success and failure at college. I don't want to pay for somebody else to get a four-year paid vacation to sit on a college campus smoking dope and playing hacky sack. Look, that doesn't always turn out bad. That's what I did. <laughs> but for the most part, it's not going to end up being free. You simply get the choice of paying for yourself or paying for everybody else. Yeah, except that they're being indoctrinated. That is correct. There, there, uh, there is no education. education. There is only indoctrination. And we actually have to do something about this. And, we, and this is something we've been discussing. I know this is a rambling speech. This is maybe my worst speech ever. <laughs> you, see, you, see, you see what you get when you don't pay for talent? <laughs> okay. But nonetheless... Yeah? All right. <laughs> well, but seriously, pretty good is the worst speech I've ever given. <laughs> the other speeches were great. Did I tell you one of the five most important conservative speeches I've ever given? Anyway. It's excellent. Okay. Um, but we have to do things, and, and the question is what, and the answer is everything all the time, from the littlest thing, like Karen said, on a supermarket checkout line, just turn to the person behind you and make a comment that lets them, that pierces that bubble in which they've never heard any other point of view. You know, can you believe they're tearing down our history and just pierce their bubble? You, one mistake that we make is we are so obviously right and they are so obviously wrong that we think if we just explain it to them, after all, they're smart. If we just explain it to them and we try to win arguments and win debates, it doesn't work that way. I have a program I call Adopt a Democrat. <laughs> All right? And I call it Adopt a Democrat because Democrats really are like children. It's why the name of my book is The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks. They really are morally and intellectually retarded, stunted, stopped, 
at the level of the five-year-old child. Right. And there's a reason for that. At the age of five, that's when Americans send their children to the education conglomerate for the first time. And that's when they get their hands on our children on a full-time basis for the first time and don't let go for another 20-something years. And it's when they are five years old, they are taught for the first time that thinking is an act of bigotry. It's an act of bigotry because anything you believe is going to be so tainted by your personal demographics, by your height, your weight, your sex, your, your, your nation of origin, your, that anything you believe is going to be so tainted by your bigotries that the only way not to be a bigot is to never think at all. That's Islam. In fact, it, it is Islam. I mean, submission to, to exactly so. the, right? And this is submission to the leftist. And by the way, there's absolutely a reason they're united in hate, as our friend Jamie Glassoff would say. It's absolutely a reason that the most misogynistic, homophobic, everything the liberals should hate is allied with the Democratic Party because they are one and the same in their desire to overthrow Western civilization. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? My program is this. It's called Adopt a Democrat. You find one person in your life that's important. Maybe a person close to you, a, a colleague of 20 years, a neighbor, a, a, a relative. Find one person in your life. And it's important that they be in your life because it's just that much harder for them to say you're a Nazi when they know you and love you. <laughs> right? You can say, listen to Dennis Prager or listen to Evan Say It or listen to... to if they don't know you, they can say, I'm a Nazi. It's a little bit harder for them to say, you're a Nazi, you're a fascist, you're a, you're a bigot, when they've known you for 20 or 30 years. And over the course of time, and this is the key. What, 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 what? I said, mine didn't have any trouble calling No. <laughs> that's, why, that's why, this is why I went, but this is why I went, it's just a little bit harder. Not <laughs> Over the course of time, you treat them like they're children. You talk to them, you have fun with them. You don't make everything a teachable moment. Right. Just like you wouldn't with your child. We don't have to win every argument. This right, is what right. we think. You wouldn't do that with your children. You have fun with them. I, I, I would say, talk about the weather, except then there's global warming. <laughs> <laughs> but if and when along the way they do or say something egregious, that's when you spank them. Mm -hmm. Just like if a child ran into the street, that's when you yeah. spank them. When, you're, when your liberal friend or relative or colleague or, says to you, I can't believe that guy made that movie that got the ambassador killed. Mm -hmm. That's when you take exception, you lay out the facts, you say, I'm not accept, and then move on. And over the course of time, you will change people. Yeah. I guarantee you will mm -hmm. change people. I have changed people. Because America is not divided in two, we're divided in three. There are those of us who get it, who get that the better does exist, that William Shakespeare isn't just taught because he's a dead white Christian European man, but because he's actually pretty good. There are those of us who get that the better does exist, that America is exceptional, that Israel is exceptional, that the Judeo-Christian value set is exceptional. Then there are people all the way on the other side, and we hear so much from them, the, the Rosie O'Donnells and the others, oh, about whom there is nothing you can do. But there's a huge group in the middle who don't hate America, who don't believe that we're fascists and we're Nazis, who don't want our statues and our history destroyed, who don't like that they're not getting educated on college campuses. They know it. They know that they want to go and hear Ben Shapiro speak and they're being physically, bodily prevented from doing so. But they're afraid. They, they don't know that they have allies out there. They don't know how many of us really agree that they're not bad people. They need to know that there are conservatives out there because there are so many people out there who have simply never heard from a conservative what a conservative believes. They've only heard from liberals. They've only heard from the news channels. They've only heard from their liberal professors. They've only heard from their favorite entertainers. Where would they have heard what a conservative believes from a conservative? So this is your job. And it's scary. And some of you are afraid for your jobs. Some of you are afraid for bodily physical harm. This is what I have to say to you. Tough. Yeah. Tough. This is war. Generations before us have fought wars. My father fought in World War II. Previous generations fought in World War I. 
these are actual physical violent battles that required my father to leave home for years on end to live in deprivation over on another continent the fact that I might lose a friendship I might lose a gig yeah. This is the easiest war any human being has ever fought, but you've got to recognize it's war and you've got to fight it. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't know what more differently, different I can say. Um, so glad you're here. So glad that Karen and AFA, American Freedom Alliance, is fighting the fight. You can give her a round of applause. Mm -hmm. I, I know this is crass, but I'm going to say it. If you want to know more about how the modern liberal thinks, feel free to purchase my book. I will sign autographed copies. And let's have some fun.